Hello. Yeah. The audience can hear yours. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Diego. I'm from Brazil. And you'll be the facilitator for this session. Our first speak is Thompson. He has uh, 10 years experience consumed at Startup Incubator and a master in computer science. Thompson, please. Shall I take over? Yeah. Great. Uh, so thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, greetings and welcome this beautiful afternoon to bu virtual Buenos Aires. Um, I'm really looking forward to this presentation today. I uh, have given a couple of talks in COVID land from my beautiful garage office, and I decided today that I wanted to be standing. So I rolled all of my garage waste away and gave myself room to pace around. Uh, I see that Diego has brought up my screen, so I'm going to switch it to full screen and then get started. Uh, welcome once again. My name is Thompson Comer. I'm a senior staff software engineer at NVIDIA, and I work in a, an open source group called Rapids. Uh, NVIDIA has been for a number of years now concentrating on building tool sets to make it easier to use GPUs and do your work better. So the title of this talk is Free Open Source Software for GPUs. Uh, and once again, thank you for coming. Uh, so just as an introduction to the talk, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about my background and about what NVIDIA is doing in open source development and in geospatial. Um, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about why you should be looking to GPUs to solve some of your problems, because essentially anything that's got a notable runtime uh, is something that a GPU could be turning into possibly a not notable runtime for you. Um, after that, I'm gonna present to you the rapid software stack of which QSpatial is a part of. And that's really what the content of this talk is gonna be about. It's a product called QSpatial. Product isn't the right word because it's not for sale. It's entirely free. You can get it on GitHub. You can get it on Conda. You can get it on Docker. And um, it's a software suite that gives you a few algorithms that will run on NVIDIA hardware and give you blistering performance in a limited subset of the spatial space. Uh, we're gonna continue working on it over time and hopefully, uh, hopefully it'll turn into a fully featured software suite for doing spatial analytics in the near future. Um, that's pretty much the content of the talk. So um, I suppose I'll continue. Um, there's four algorithms that are especially useful that are presented in the QSpatial um, library. And there's also GeoPandas compatibility for IO. Uh, I felt like the thing that was missing most from what we had built was ease of use. Uh, and so I wrote a layer that converts any GeoPandas data frame into uh, something that will run on the GPU. And then the last piece of information that I want to share with you has to do with Apache's Arrow format, which is a, a growing, high-performance, uh, sequential, what a, I don't think tabular is quite the right word. It's an array format. It's a, an array format with high performance and a really good adoption that's been growing in popularity. And as part of my work with QSpatial, I proposed, along with Kyle Barron, and uh, Joris Vandenbosch of GeoPandas and Paul Taylor, a format called GeoArrow. Uh, obviously, we don't need a lot of new formats in the spatial space, uh, but GeoArrow really helps with GPU performance. So I'll talk about that in some more detail. If there's time left at the end of it, I'm gonna give a, so a short software demonstration if there are no questions. Uh, so once again, I'm Thompson Comer. I received a master's degree in computer science from Colorado State University in 2009. 
Uh, my emphasis at that time was in computer vision, artificial intelligence, uh, computational geometry, and so forth. And uh, after that degree, I went on to do a little bit more than 10 years of consulting at a startup incubator in, near Boulder, Colorado, called Cardinal Peak. Uh, two of the projects that I did in that time that are especially of interest in the spatial space are uh, geofencing in the mobile context. Pretty much every mobile app at the time was really interested in geofencing. Uh, and it was, an, it was really uh, interesting research to discover how ineffective it was. Um, piggybacking on ineffective position location, uh, I also did about a year and a half researching for Samsung on indoor position estimation using the cell phone towers to get kind of a gross position estimation and then using uh, the RSSI signal of individual Wi-Fi routers and their IDs to try to build indoor maps and indoor locations, which is also, I'm sure many of you know, uh, super difficult. Um, I started with NVIDIA three years ago, working on their open source, artificial intelligence, data science, machine learning, and geospatial software tool set called RAPIDS, which is a huge umbrella. Um, it's a subject of two slides from now, so I'll get into more detail on that. Um, but for the last three years, I've been writing what I call machine learning and uh, spatial middleware so that you can take software that you've already written to solve a particular kind of problem that runs on CPU and move it over to one of NVIDIA's GPUs to get you massive performance increases. Um, most of our libraries uh, and, and we're talking about long runtime challenges. Most of our libraries are giving people uh, 100 to 1,000 times performance increases. Um, and sometimes it's only, you know, five times or six times, uh, but it's always um, a tremendous speed up. Uh, so that, that leads me to NVIDIA. Uh, I don't think that the spatial community is giving NVIDIA a whole lot of attention yet. Um, but I think you should because we want to be noticed and we want to get into every scientific computing domain. So in 2007, I was a graduate student and NVIDIA released the CUDA language. Um, CUDA is a, uh, what, is it, what does it stand for? Um, compute, compute Unified Domain Architecture, whatever that implies. Uh, what it really is, is it's a C, C++ and Fortran compatible language that runs directly on NVIDIA's GPU hardware. Uh, of course, NVIDIA started out making video game cards, right? Uh, a graphics processing unit or GPU uh, is a gaming accelerator originally. What are they really good for? They do uh, a whole lot of matrix multiplies really, really fast. So the, the typical GPU architecture is the CPU loads some block of data, typically a large block of data into memory. It uses the DMA buffer to copy that memory onto the GPU hardware. And then it preloads some executable kernel, some piece of code onto the GPU and then calls the GPU to execute that code. The GPU has, uh, I don't know, in the olden days, maybe 200 individual cores, uh, and today it's got more like 4,000 or 6,000 cores that all have uh, essentially O of one, like uh, almost, um, what am I looking for? Uh, register level access to the entire memory space, all 6,000 cores do. So very fast access to the memory. It executes this kernel across the memory and is able to do uh, you know, 4,000 cores in parallel doing a single matrix multiply or some other simple operation. And then that final result, in the case of video games, it's just copied straight to the display. In the case of data science and spatial, we take the result of that, copy it back to the host, and you can get back to working with it in the language that you're used to. Um, this presentation is mostly about Python um, though QSpatial has a C++ native library as well as a Python native library, the Python code just calls directly down to the C++, so you can use it either way. Um, 
NVIDIA has really branched out into data centers and into new uh, almost system architectures, right? So our latest card is called the A100, and you can get single built servers that are purpose built with eight or 16 A100 cards in them. Um, each A100 card has 80 gigs of ultra high performance parallelized video memory. Uh, and uh, what I'm getting at is that we are now providing uh, data center based solutions that have a terabyte of high performance parallelized memory in a single server. Uh, so it absolutely crushes most of the competition. If you want to get the same kind of performance out of a Spark server, you need 50 nodes in order to keep up with a single NVIDIA node. Uh, so as your data size grows, which I know it is, um, you're going to want to be working with GPUs. All right, so finally, I'm going to get onto the software now. QSpatial is the, the spatial component of the Rapids umbrella. And Rapids is... Um, Rapids is a uh, um, recursive acronym. It's a uh, rapid accelerated performance in data science over and over again, I believe. And uh, what we're doing is we're building open source software to mimic as closely as we can for the end user's benefit uh, most of the really popular data science tools. So QDF on the left is um, almost perfectly cross compatible with pandas. And it provides a, a data frame layer that allows you to do merges and joins and sorts and searches uh, and even uh, uh, applies across massive data frames with millions or even billions of rows in high performance on a GPU. Uh, the analytics section in the middle uh, QML, uh, the Q machine learning, uh, it mimics SciPy, it mimics Scikit-Learn. Uh, it also provides graph functionality in QGraph. Uh, and then we're also integrating with the visualization layer for, for generating these graphs with QX filter. We've got Plotly compatibility, Bokeh compatibility, and so forth. And now down along the bottom, there's a few more uh, specialized domain-specific libraries. Uh, you can see there is QSpatial, um, which is what I'm presenting up to you today on. Uh, so I'll get into QSpatial now. GPU geoscience. Um, QSpatial is intended to look like GeoPandas. And I've written an IO layer so that any data frame that you load in GeoPandas, you can move on to the GPU in a single call. You don't have to learn about GPU memory allocation, which is one of the hardest parts of, of gaining skill at CUDA. Um, you move that memory using the GeoPandas IO layer from the host onto the GPU. And I have four algorithms that I'm gonna present on you to, on to you today uh, that have massive performance increases. If you are using them in one of your geospatial workflows today, if you have access to a GPU, which you can get online um, through uh, Google Colab, and I think there's another source at this point that I'll have to look up um, that you can get access to a GPU online. You can take advantage of these algorithms today. Um, it's also important to note that QSpatial is presented in this geo arrow format that I'm going to talk about and try to pitch for you. And then at the end of the talk, I will uh, call for you to take a look at it and see if you can use it. All right, so the first step in using QSpatial is use GeoPandas. Uh, when this library started out, I had custom libraries for doing IO. Uh, we do actually have a shape file reader built into QSpatial that I welcome you to use. And it is uh, parallelized and faster than what you're gonna get with GeoPandas here. Um, the benefit of using this GeoPandas uh, integration layer is that it works with basically you know any data source. Uh, it, you can see a, the simplest possible use case here of how to get it. Import GeoPandas, import this QSpatial library in Python, and then uh, you call geopandas.read, 
and you can read, you know, read file works on almost any data source. It uses Python's Shapely underneath GeoPandas. And then of course, Shapely depends on GDAL. And so any data source that GDAL can read, GeoPandas can read. Um, there's the variables here have two names to reflect where the memory is located. And this is a crucial distinction to make when you're doing GPU programming. Uh, zones sub host is gonna be the GeoPandas data frame. Uh, and it's gonna be, um, well, it's precisely GeoPandas. All that data is gonna be stored in your main memory. Now the zones GPU object in this case, we call qspatial.fromgeopandas. It's gonna copy all that data. And this was not trivial to build because it turns out that GDAL and Shapely's object representation format is, uh, well, let's call it extremely object oriented. It's just like a WKB file, if you're familiar with that, or WKT. Each feature contains um, header information about that feature, followed by the data information about that feature, its coordinates, and so forth. And when you want to read a whole bunch of features in sequence, you can't parallelize them because all the features are stored in uh, order, one after the other, but you don't know where the next feature begins until you have read the header of the preceding feature. So in order for me to move this data from GeoPandas onto the GPU, I have to iterate over every feature. I have to deconstruct them. I have to pull all the coordinates out. And then they get densely backed into this geo arrow format that I'll go into in a minute. It's also essential for using the algorithms that have been provided in QSpatial. So I said, I've got four algorithms for you. There are a few more. Uh, and like I said, it's a growing space. It's a function of what people want, which I will talk about in a few minutes and what we're planning on building next. Uh, and it's also a function of the amount of resources that I can get. It looks like I'll have no trouble filling the time. Just checking my clock over here. Uh, I'm gonna take a drink, even though it's only a half an hour presentation. So the killer app for QSpatial is our point and polygon implementation. Uh, we also have a, a directed house dwarf, dwarf distance implementation that crushes the competition. Haversine distance is relatively easy, uh, but if you need to compute haversite distance on a lot of points, you're going to want to use our implementation. Uh, and then finally, I have a cubic spline fit based on scikit-learns, or maybe it's scipy's API, that is probably the fastest public API for uh, cubic spline fitting that's available. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about each of these in a little bit of API level detail, um, because you need to know the details of the, these APIs to use them. There are two point in polygon algorithms available with QSpatial. The one on the bottom there, dot point in polygon, is the legacy algorithm. It's older, and it's more useful for kind of a one-shot approach. The reason for that is because with the top algorithm, the quad tree point in polygon, you have to build a quad tree first. You have to pass in all of your polygon points, and then a quad tree is going to be built that is going to increase performance of the algorithm, but it takes more steps. Uh, so if you have fewer than 31, no, no, fewer than 32 polygons, and you want to do a one shot, the lower example, the legacy point in polygon is the best for you. You're going to pass in one buffer of X's, which you're going to get out of the GeoPandas uh, data frame that you copied to your GPU using from GeoPandas. You're going to use one buffer of Y coordinates. And then these offsets are important. This is something that's um, Another part of the geo error format that we're going to be pushing. You've got a buffer of, say, latitude and longitudes or a buffer of XY coordinates, and it's all the XY coordinates in your entire data source. Now, in this case, it's all the XY coordinates of the polygons in your data source and only the polygons. And we support polygons and multi polygons to be specific. Um, in order for the GPU to tell the difference between polygon number one and polygon number two with high performance, we pass in a list of offsets. That's We're looking at the lower API again, the poly ring offsets or the poly offsets. The offsets are actually 
um, indices into the set of polygon rings. And then in the next array, those are your polygon ring offsets. So each individual polygon has an offset that determines from the original test points which points fall inside of that polygon. Okay, and the first ring of every polygon is its outer ring, and then all subsequent rings of that polygon are its inner rings. Okay, those are important details. Uh, and then finally, the the points, poly points X and Y are the points that are actually in the polygons. Uh, the, the two first arguments are the points that we want to find point in polygon. Um, quad tree works pretty much the same way, but it's going to have some intermediate products, which you can read about in the documentation. I'm not going to go into detail for that. Um, the reason you want to use quad tree point in polygon is because it works with a truly arbitrary number of polygons. Uh, so you can have 15,000 polygons and 20 million points in a single API call, and you're going to get results back that are basically in real time. The directed house door distance algorithm is, uh, I think, my second killer algorithm in this space. Uh, it computes the Cartesian product of all of the directed house door distances of um, line strings in some buffer. So when you call it, you pass a list of x's, a list of y's, and a list of offsets, which in this case we're just calling spaces. And then what you're going to get back is an n by n array of all of the Hausdorff distances between every Cartesian pair of the space that you're passing in. Uh, once again, it's in real time. And I, I, I did a demo of this. I built a benchmark of this um, prior to building this presentation. And the runtime of the host implementation using SciPy's Hausdorff distance over the uh, it's, and, and it's actually half of the number of Cartesian products because with, in the SciPy case, I only did, uh, if you will, the lower triangular of the Cartesian product matrix. Uh, it took six minutes to run, and the GPU solution took 22 milliseconds. Uh, so the performance difference is just absolutely vast. If you are waiting on algorithms like this in your workflows, um, spend more time talking to me and getting to know about GPUs. Uh, so Cubic Spline is, uh, I'm presenting the API here. Uh, one note needs to be presented about it. Uh, this is based on SciPy's Cubic Spline, and it has the exact same API signature as Cubic Spline in SciPy, so that you don't have to change your code if you want to run it on a GPU. Uh, the important distinction is that SciPy only computes a single Cubic Spline. And in the case of QSpatial, you can pass in n cubic splines in your T and Y arguments. And then your prefixes argument is the same as your offsets argument in the, um, the case of the preceding two algorithms. Now, I actually I have to back that up because I remember that in the current implementation of tridiagonal matrix solving in CUDA, all of my cubic splines have to be of the same length. Uh, so your size is actually going to be what determines what the offset is. And you can pass in 10,000 cubic splines simultaneously for computing, say, trajectory fits. Uh, but they all have to have the same number of samples. So it could be 10,000 trajectories, each with 10 coordinates. Um, and uh, I'm working to improve that in the near future. All right, finally, Haversine distance the performance of this is comical compared to CPU. It's a simple algorithm. Everybody hey, knows how it works. Hey, Diego. Please. Uh, do you have two minutes for finalize the, the presentation? Yeah, sure. Okay. okay, so real quickly then, uh, to finish this up, I thought I had 30 minutes, but maybe I only had 25. Um, point and polygon is 90,000 times faster in a Python implementation. 115 uh, Haversine distance is 115,000 times faster in a Python implementation, and Hausdorff distance is 1,400 times faster in a Python implementation. Uh, I was hoping to have a little bit more time for Arrow. Um, this is a presentation of how the data gets stored on the GPU for high performance. If you're curious about where this is going, please come into GitHub and talk with us about it. Um, 
there are three things that I want to build into QSpatial as soon as possible. I want to have actual geometry types and features that you can edit on the GPU and do queries on in the GPU. I want to have basic geo ops like intersection and uh, um, union. And I want to build in coordinate systems so that it's easy to transform from one type to another. All right, finally, please come see the work that we're doing in Rapids and in QSpatial. You can get QSpatial. You can download a Docker image and run it on your machine if you have an NVIDIA GPU easily from rapids.ai slash start.html. You can also install it using Conda, or you can come uh, visit me in GitHub at uh, github.com slash rapidsai slash QSpatial. Thank you for coming, everyone. Uh, my name is Thompson Comer, and uh, I believe it's time possibly for questions. Do we have any, Diego? Hello, Thompson. Thank you for your talk. I have some questions. The first one is, how is your learning curve curve for using QSpatial, what is usually the best way to migrate legacy ETL solutions? Yeah, well, that's, that's the perfect question. And we're trying to provide that for you. Um, the learning curve is easy in the sense that it's already GeoPandas compatible. If you can read with GeoPandas, you can use QSpatial. There is a, there's a layer of data incompatibility still, where um, you will need to ask a question maybe on GitHub about using the APIs so that you can pull the exact coordinates out to pass them into QSpatial. Uh, but in terms of, mi of uh, migrating with legacy ETL, QDF, which QSpatial is based on, is based on pandas, and it's very close to pandas. And probably 80% of our users are able to, uh, if you will, in the, the beginning of your um, Jupyter Notebooks file, you can change import pandas as PD to import QDF as PD and run it. And 80% of the time it works perfectly. There's, there's certain limitations in parallel processing and in GPU memory allocation that can bite you. Um, but the, our goal is for it to be like essentially zero learning curve. Have a GPU, use QDF just like pandas. Uh, only performance is massive. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is another question. We have we have two minutes. Um, yeah, sorry, I missed your message at twelve seventeen. <laughs> uh, could this be used for rasterizing vector tile polygons into raster map tiles? Example: do points in polygons across every pixel in a 2006. Um, huh? Yes, absolutely. Um, the way that I would approach that is I would create a vector of, or rather a buffer of polygon coordinates. And then I would simply feed in uh, a data frame, if you will, containing every pixel coordinate within that polygon. And what you get back would be a, a mask of exactly which polygons fell within the polygon that you designed. Um, we don't have raster support directly yet we're working on that and we're interested in it but um if you hop in and ask a question i can point you toward a, a mimicked raster solution pretty easily and it, like i said the performance is just huge okay thank you a lot thomas thompson thanks everybody and, thanks, Diego. and uh there is another question in the chat can you answer the questions there, Nelson, uh, please? I don't see any questions in the chat. I see a private chat. In said, the Venueless. Oh, back in uh, the application? Yeah. Yeah, I'll hop in there and I'll answer any questions. And uh, I believe we can move on to the next presentation, if that's what you yeah, want. Yeah, 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 there is. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. And uh, hopefully we can be friends on GitHub.